Hello and uh, welcome everyone. We're just getting going. Um, people are people are joining us, which is fantastic. Just give it one more one more minute. All right. So my name is Amanda Lawrence, and thank you all for coming along to the ADMS seminar on automating Wikimedia. Um, I'm Amanda Lawrence. I'm a research fellow at RMIT University and at the ARC Centre of Auto, uh, Automated Decision Making and Society. And, um, and also I am a Wikimedian in residence at ADMS. And this seminar is part of uh, making connections between researchers and the Wikimedia ecosystem, including Wikimedia Australia, which is the local chapter of the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, so I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which RMIT University stands and where I'm speaking from today, and to respectfully uh, recognise elders both past and present and their collective wisdom handed down through the generations. Um, I'd also like to remind you this seminar is being recorded and will be made uh, publicly available hopefully in about a week or so by uh, the ADMS YouTube channel. So presenting today, we have Professor Julian Thomas, Director of the ADMS and Distinguished Professor in the School of Media and Communications at RMIT University, who will give a brief introduction followed by M Professor Mark Sanderson, Dean for Research and Innovation at RMIT University uh, for the Schools of Engineering and of Computing Technologies in the STEM College. Uh, Mr. Liam Wyatt, Senior Program Manager at the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, who has been closely involved with the development of Wikimedia Enterprise. And Associate Professor Heather Ford, Head of Discipline for Digital and Social Media in the School of Communication at UTS. And it was actually uh, Heather uh, being awarded an Australian Research Council Discovery Grant that was the inspiration for bringing this, um, bringing this group together and this topic. The three speakers will present for around 10 or so minutes each, and um, hopefully there'll be time for some questions at the end. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to uh, get to them at the end where you can either, I can read them out or you can uh, give them yourself. So without further ado, I will hand over to Professor Julian Thomas. Thanks Amanda. And I, I, I won't take 10 minutes just to provide, uh, I think a, a brief introduction and context if I can. We thought it'd be good to tell you a little bit about our ADMS centre uh, where we're, um, uh, where, which, which has organised this, sorry for that interruption, uh, and, and, and just also why this sort of, what, what, why this topic is so important for us. The, so the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society is uh, a, an Australian Research Council funded centre, that's an Australian Commonwealth Government research uh, funding body. Uh, and the so, apologies, uh, and our centre uh, is it is designed to uh, develop the knowledge base which is required for responsible, ethical, and inclusive automated decision making. It, it's a multidisciplinary centre. I, I think you can sort of get the flavour of the multidisciplinarity that's necessary to engage with the sorts of issues we're interested in today, just from the composition of the uh, speakers that we have have today. Um, it, it brings together uh, researchers from the humanities, so the social sciences and, and, the, and, and the computing sciences and, and, and data sciences. It's also a distributed centre. It uh, comprises nine Australian universities and, and many industry partner organisations and overseas research organisations. We're working on, not just on how decision-making, automated decision-making systems work, but also on how people use uh, uh, decision-making technologies uh, the, the, across the whole spectrum from various kinds of automated, uh, of artificial intelligence uh, to the blockchain. We're interested in understanding the institutional contexts of automation of this kind, and, and especially uh, relevant to today, we're very interested in how the, the our flows of data 
data collections, data markets, uh, and, and data managing organisations um, shape automation in a range of contexts. We do that in order to better understand how we can manage the risks and benefits of accelerating uh, digital transformation in, in four key domains of social life, in, in news and media, in health, in transport and mobility, uh, and, and in social services. So all areas where the kind of data we're talking about today is, is particularly important. I wanted to thank Amanda and, and all our participants, particularly for uh, coming together to talk about this today. Wikimedia is, is critically important for our understanding of the broader information ecology of, of search, which we see as a, as a fundamental technology here. I think we'll be talking more about that soon. We also see it, of course, as a, as a key location for the operation of, of pioneering automated systems in, in, in areas like content moderation, in, in editing, and in various kinds of automated content, so in, in, in areas like summarizing and, and so forth. And, and it's also, of course, a, a critical area where we can understand better the engagement of people uh, with automated systems. Uh, it's an extraordinary source of, of course, of text and images for the training of machine learning systems. So really significant for us, very important for us to know more about it. And uh, I'll hand back to Amanda so we can get into the content. Thanks very much. Thanks, Julian. That's fantastic. Um, so we'll be starting with uh, Mark Sanderson. So I'll hand over to Mark. Thanks very much. Um, let me get my... Okay, so um, Amanda asked if I could speak um, a little bit about search and also information boxes. Um, and so I thought the simplest thing that we could do, assuming you can see my screen, um, is just sort of type in some um, searches and just kind of try and do a bit of a tour about what it is that search and information boxes, how they sort of work. Um, I mean, so uh, automated decision. Uh, so if, for example, um, I type in a search, um, which let's go for the name of the center and so society. Um, so um, uh, search is something that, that we've sort of um, have become extremely familiar with. Um, in fact, Google is coming up for its 25th anniversary. Um, it was in sort of, I think, 1998 uh, when the first beta versions of Google were starting to, um, to, to operate. Um, um, so, so while it's something that we're very familiar with, um, it, it's always struck me that I don't know how familiar people are with the way that search actually sort of operates. And here when I'm talking about search, I mean this part of the search page, the so-called organic pages, uh, the so-called organic part of the search result page. Um, um, many people talk about things called page rank, which is uh, 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 something that Google talked about in one of its very early papers. Um, but actually that plays a very minor role. Um, um, the, the way that sort of Google does uh, when you type in a query, you'll notice that it claims there's about 80 million documents that have the words that I typed in, uh, those five words. So how does Google decide which of those 80 million to put um, into the top 10 of that organic search result page? Um, it's largely a process of using multiple clues. Um, you might be surprised. I mean, actually, just do, do the words match in the title of the web page is a pretty strong clue that it uses. Um, they also use um, uh, a, a little known, but I think very powerful technique that they use is they look at the links that point to people's pages. So the uh, ADMS Center, when we when we first launched the ADMS Center web page. It wasn't featuring very high uh, in Google's uh, ranking. And so uh, possibly one of my more significant contributions to the center so far was to advise Julian on how to get the web page uh, on, onto number one uh, position in Google. And the answer was to get as many of the people who are partners um, in the center to link to this website and to make sure that the blue anchor text that was in that link had the name of the center in that because Google actually doesn't worry too much about what words are on your page. Um, um, 
but it worries a lot about what the words that other people use to describe your page. And, and in, in, in order to get a description of what those words are, they look at the links that, uh, they look at the text and the links that point to your pages. And that's a very strong clue that Google uses when it's, uh, when it's doing search. So the, the kind of the organic part of search that we've been seeing for so long um, is essentially um, a, a, a word overlap process. It, look, it looks for matches between queries and documents um, and, and sorts the document, sorts the, the list of documents they have by, by the degree to which the document matches your query. But we also see these boxes over here, these info boxes. Um, and it's uh, Amanda's given me 10 minutes uh, and, and I wouldn't really have the time to talk about how Google goes about doing this. But what you're seeing in these info boxes on the right hand side is Google's uh, knowledge graph. So, gosh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, they started building a knowledge graph, which was a, uh, uh, a structure of information that represents uh, knowledge uh, that it has gained from trusted sources. So a, a big uh, trusted source that they use is Wikipedia, but they use a number of different trusted sources. And they've essentially come up with methods to try and automatically extract that information from these trusted sources, and then they get placed into the knowledge graph. And then when we do searches on Google, um, we get matches uh, on the documents that Google has, but we also um, get matches in their knowledge graph, which they then structure into this information box. The, uh, the knowledge graph, uh, it, it's prone to making mistakes. Um, um, there, there's uh, people quite often talk about, uh, have you seen the mistake uh, that Google has made uh, in trying to pull this information out of the knowledge graph? My favorite one um, is this one. How many legs does, I keep checking this every time I do it because uh, I keep wondering whether they fixed it. But if you ask Google, how many legs does a chicken have? It tells you that it has four. Apparently, this is because it's really it, it transputes transmutes the word legs into limbs, um, and then birds have four limbs. Um, but you get this kind of answer. Um, so the, the knowledge graph does have mistakes in it, or, or, or can sort of um, end up uh, making these kinds of mistakes. One of the things that is also perhaps worth noting is that we're a lot less tolerant of mistakes with with uh, with the information box. I mean, I could type in ADMS, which is the name of our center and discover that ADMS does not get uh, the automated decision-making in Society Center. But I don't blame Google for that. I blame myself. Uh, oh, I typed in the wrong query. I should try a different query. But when you, uh, when you ask Google uh, to find information about a particular person, um, you sort of set this higher standard about what you want to see. Um, and so uh, the information box um, is, you know, is something that you want to sort of see that works well. It doesn't only pull information out from Wikipedia, so I don't have a Wikipedia page, um, um, but uh, what it's pulling here is it seems to have discovered that there is this entity called Mark Sanderson who seems to be a researcher, and it seems to be getting that probably from its Google Scholar pages and then noticing that there are connections with, with other social media pages as well. Um, it, it struggles uh, with these information boxes, it struggles with, um, with ambiguity. So there are actually three Mark Sanderson's according to Google. There's a screenwriter who's written stuff for Hollywood um, and has a few sort of, um, has his own website, has Twitter and so on. He's got an entry on IMDB. I'm sure IMDB is another trusted source that they use. There is a separate author uh, called Mark Sanderson um, and the system is a bit confused about this. So this isn't me, there's somebody um, who writes uh, literature in the UK, um, and the, the 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 knowledge graph is getting confused about um, about about who's there. So these these info boxes, um, as I said, are pulling information out of the knowledge graph, but the knowledge graph um, is not something that is perfect uh, by any means. Another thing that you can notice um, when you're looking at these uh, at these knowledge at these info boxes, just a little tip for you. You'll notice um, this is my info box here. If I type in the info box of somebody else, say in the uh, uh, in the center of excellent that we have, I've not typed her name correctly, but Deborah Lupton, for example. So here's an info box from uh, from Deborah's uh, uh, collected uh, information. 
One of the things you'll notice um, is that uh, a lot of these info boxes have this little button down here that says claim this knowledge panel. So one of the other things, one of the other sources for info boxes is people can actually register themselves with Google um, and so actually control the info box themselves. So Deborah hasn't done that, uh, not really any need to. Deborah's info box is in uh, excellent shape. I, you'll notice that that button isn't there for me because I did actually claim access to this particular page. You have to do go through an authentication process with Google uh, and then they give you access to that page. Uh, and so I can um, send them edits um, and, and suggestions to that page. So these info boxes are actually a mixture of information extracted from uh, things like Wikipedia, pulled into their knowledge graph, but then they also actually have trusted people uh, who've gone through an authentication process who can also make suggestions about how the box works. Um, I could probably stop there, Amanda, uh, but that was just sort of a, a quick overview about sort of search and information boxes. Great, thanks, Mark. Um, I'm not sure if there's any uh, questions on that uh, straight up, or we can move on to uh, Liam. If anybody wants to raise their hand, uh, we could uh, have time for a quick question. Otherwise, we will move on to Liam, Liam Wyatt for the Wikimedia Foundation. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning from Italy. As you probably can tell, I am Australian, but I am coming to you from the other side of the world uh, where I live these days. I'd like to uh, speak to you, if I'm able to share my screen, uh, about a, let's try this. Is that working for, uh, for shared screen purposes? Yes. Excellent. So this is uh, Wikimedia Enterprise, the new, shall we say, search engine optimization optimization system from the Wikimedia Foundation. The result of many years of discussing what is the best way to have an actual relationship of, of equals with search engines and others, major commercial reusers of Wikimedia knowledge, Wikimedia information, which is a really interesting challenge from the perspective of knowledge equity, a concept that is, that is key to the strategy of the Wikimedia movement these days. Uh, knowledge as a service, a play on the concept of um, software as a service that you will have heard in, in the computing world and the, in the IT sector a lot. These are the two key principles of the strategic move, strategic plan that's, that's uh, currently in, in the process of being enacted in the Wikimedia movement, knowledge equity and knowledge as a service. Given that we all know that there is a kind of symbiotic relationship between Wikimedia and search engines for content use, useful information, but also for visibility in, in, in the reverse. But that relationship is not of equals. It's not of, it's not necessarily a friendly one. It's a kind of a useful rivalry, but mutual dependence at the same time. How to pro simultaneously provide greater access to high quality information to improve the kinds of things that were just presented in search boxes, both the organic results and the, the knowledge panels on the side, not just for Google, but for any search engine. And most importantly, or equally importantly these days, audio. So things like Alexa and uh, Siri and those kinds of uh, virtual digital assistants that are audio uh, operated. And also, here's the rub, it's not just a question of the data, it's a question of the finances. We have this really interesting challenge of sustainability within the movement uh, of the data is provided of, under free license. Anyone can use it, anyone can use it for commercial purposes. That is entirely within the point and purpose of Wikimedia knowledge, it is freely licensed. And so being a non-commercial organization and a non-commercial movement, we don't have ads. Simultaneously, 
is core to the mission that we don't restrict or have any problem with someone else downstream using that information for commercial purposes. That's fine. But that results in a bit of a question of the tragedy of the commons, if you're familiar with that metaphor, that by virtue of having a uh, libertarian approach to anyone can do whatever they want, means that the, ma the majority of people are crowded out by the large players in the field. The metaphor tragedy of the commons refers to the idea of a commons of, of in the town being overgrazed by a couple of people to the benefit of, of self-interest, but it means that the most people no longer have access to good quality grass. So this is a question of reversing that financial dependence uh, where large organizations like search engines pay for high speed, high stability, commercially reliable, contractually provided access to the same data as everyone else, thereby reversing the financial um, trend, they subsidize us rather than we subsidize them. And the second part is the um, is ensuring that the quality of the information is, if not better, because it's the same data, that the, that the ability of those, inf those uh, reusers to have more signals, we're calling it credibility signals as a concept, um, to know what to update when or when potentially on, a, on their own basis, they can do what they want to hold back from updating because maybe there's a lot of vandalism, maybe there's a lot of things changing suddenly. It's important to, to acknowledge or to re-emphasize that the data is the same, but providing more signals to reusers who particularly those who are using it at high speed, like search engines. Some may wish to take everything as fast as they can, all updates, all changes, and refresh their internal knowledge graph as frequently as possible, and that's fine. Some others may wish to hold back uh, for precisely the same reason, because there's lots of changes. And that's a different business decision, a different um, policy about how they want to take information from the internet and refresh it within their own data set. Wikimedia Foundation, and, and through this service, Wikimedia Enterprise, is agnostic to how you use the information. That's quite important as a principle that it's not saying this is good or this is bad, this is vandalism, this is not. That's a question for the community to define. But allowing downstream users to have information within the metadata of what is being sent to them to make up their own opinions um, based on publicly available information. Things like this page currently has a spike of readership. This page currently has a spike of uh, anonymous editors who lots of different editors are suddenly changing this page. That could be an indication of vandalism. That could be an indication of newsworthiness. They're just different um, definitions of the same data, and it's up to the reuser to define how they choose to do that. Uh, I would like to, that's a kind of an introduction to the principle or the purpose of this process of this new uh, concept, um, both from a financial ideological perspective, um, but rather than continue talking about a business model and, 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 uh, and so forth, I wanna uh, throw the microphone back to Amanda and Mark and potentially uh, Heather to make it uh, more conversational. Uh, I can, of course, continue talking about this, but I wanted to show that we're um, responding to the interests of the audience, not just to the interests of, uh, of the speaker. Thanks, uh, thanks, Liam. Uh, we actually had a little bit of trouble um, getting Heather forward here. Uh, so that's, um, yeah, we've just got a few technical difficulties difficulties which we're trying to work through. Um, it would be, uh, I, I personally, oh, I think that might be Heather. Uh, yeah. Heather. Right. <laughs> Hello, Heather. Thank you. I'm so sorry uh, about the, um, the problems with um, no Zoom login and uh, yeah. All good. I'm just on a completely different machine. My colleague, um, brought me his machine, which is super helpful. Um, 
but I just managed to get my presentation up. So um, I am ready to start. I haven't heard the other presentations, but um, <laughs> if you let me share my screen, it should work. Okay, let's let's go on with that, and then we can bring things together and have a chat afterwards. Okay, great. okay awesome. Um, so, ten minutes, right, Amanda? Ten, twelve minutes? Okay, great. Um, so, I just wanted to um, share a little bit of the um, research that I've been doing over the last few years. Um, and kind of leading into the new research that I'm really interested in. Um, and uh, some of it's gonna come out in a book, which I'll talk about, um, but I've entitled that uh, the presentation today, The Automation of All Human Knowledge. So um, if this helps, if this works. Um, no, this is a completely different presentation, apologies. Oh, I'm playing it from Dropbox, that's why, wow. Um, okay, so the, the thing that I wanna talk about today is two um, events that happened, which you've probably now heard about from, uh, from Liam, definitely, if not the other speakers, um, that happened in 2012. And one was the launch of Wikidata, um, which described itself as a kind of knowledge base uh, that housed structured data. Um, so the idea about Wikidata is rather than um, housing information in articles like um, Wikipedia would do or documents, uh, information would be organized according to relationships. And um, the idea about structured data is that it enables information to be automatically updated across a range of different languages in Wikipedia. Uh, so for example, um, Wikidata now houses the interwiki links between um, different language versions of the same article. And so, um, and also the infobox data. So if uh, we, we had a change of president or prime minister in Australia, for example, um, you'd very easily be able to change that on one language and have it automatically replicate to, to over 300 languages of Wikipedia. So the idea here is that it really saves time and makes Wikipedia more current. Now, another thing that happened in 2012, um, which you may have also um, heard about from them, is the knowledge graph. And uh, this is also really significant. Um, Google launched the knowledge graph in 2012. And what it did was um, Google was saying that instead of receiving a list, a possible list of um, of websites where you could resolve your query or your question. And uh, now you could actually have facts being represented to you directly within Google. And the, um, those facts are, were, would be uh, presented in what's called a knowledge panel. And you can see an example there uh, from the blog post that launched this by Amit Singhal. Um, in 2012. And so both of these um, implementations were around the same idea, the development of structured data um, and this idea of the semantic web that had been boiling for, for many years, but um, hadn't seen any major projects. And these were two really significant projects that gave the semantic web a real boost. Now, um, the argument that I am going to advance today is uh, the following. So the first idea is that uh, the rhetoric around these new projects is that they're purely technical. You know, um, we thought about them as really technical, just technical means of solving prob problems um, and that their data is objective. So as social scientists, we always balk at this idea that data can be objective, but it's really being spoken about a lot um, uh, by multiple projects that somehow semantic data or knowledge graph data really rises above other kinds of data um, in its objectivity. Um, and then finally that the outcome is to enhance efficiency. So that is what the outcome of this data is. Um, and you know, there's many people in the Wikimedia movement, for example, that believe that uh, this is really effective way of sharing open factual data. So this was always the point of um, Wikipedia um, information that it would be shared as widely as possible. The, the argument that I've been advanced just in the very short time that I have today is to think about 
um, to say that actually this development of structured and semantic data in this kind of alliance that I'm calling um, the, the new move towards structured data by many of these um, large organizations, it actually requires significant social and political resources that aren't often considered um, and actually have really important implications for human agency and algorithmic decision making and the diversity of knowledge production. So they really have important social and political consequences. And importantly, it really, um, these impact on how we come to know ourselves and each other. So I think this is really significant um, area that is not really being um, addressed so much at the moment. Um, so many of these ideas are, um, apologies, I keep having to move this thing because it's in the drop box. Um, um, but many of these ideas are in my book, which is going to be released in November um, and with a forward by Ethan Zuckerman. But today I'm just going to talk about three examples. So my argument is really what I'm trying to show you today is just how these, just some examples of how um, this move to structured data is actually very political and that the decisions that I'll be making have significant political representational consequences. Um, so what I did in this book is I looked at um, a single article on Wikipedia, the 2011 Egyptian revolution. And I basically tra uh, traced over the period of 10 years, how facts that were curated and created in Wikipedia, then moved through the infrastructure the, of the internet and, um, and then eventually moved into things like the knowledge graph, which was developed uh, and launched a year later. So the, uh, I'll show you three examples in the time that I have. So the first example, um, now nowadays um, using semantic search, you can actually ask, what is the Egyptian revolution to Google? And what you'll get is an info box. Today, this is what it looks like. I've been following and tracing it over 10 years, which has seen some very interesting changes. Um, and one of the things that, we'll note, that you'll notice is that Wikipedia is usually cited on the first kind of definitional statement, um, but then usually it's not cited um, in any of these statements afterwards. Uh, there is computational research that suggests that Wikipedia is a common source for even those facts that aren't cited. Now, some of the debates um, around Wikipedia um, and, um, or not Wikipedia, apologies, uh, about the, the info box in particular in relation to this um, are around the politics of extraction, citation and verification. So these are questions like um, what selections are made in the extraction, because as you'll see in that example, it's not a perfect extraction of um, what the Wikipedia definition, the first line in the Wikipedia article looks like. So there are selections being made here. Um, the second really important question that's been subject to lots of debates um, in the Wikimedia movement is whether hyperlinks just bring users back to the internal platform pages. So in Google, there has been some research that says that um, you know, with the development of um, the, the knowledge panels, um, increasingly users are being sent um, back within Google pages or whether they sent out to the source. Um, and then finally, if and how the source is cited. So questions like, can users easily go to the target article to do things that are related to user agency? Being things in Wikipedia that are very normal, things like checking the source, um, changing incorrect inf um, information, or at least engaging in a debate with other editors. And then finally, something that's really important to the Wikimedia Foundation, being able to donate, because you won't see the, the buttons to donate if you're not on that page. So those are some of the debates that have been happening. The second kind of question or second um, aspect of how political this is, um, is just an example of um, this date. Now, I followed this article, as I say, for uh, many years, and in particular um, on the 11th of February. And the date when a revolution ends, um, ends up being incredibly politically rife, as you can imagine. So um, here, uh, I call this event data politics. So what we know about data is that um, 
by definition, what data is doing is it's summarizing, simplifying, abstract, and it's removing nuance and context. And it's placing this data into new contexts, which gather new meanings. Um, and so it's not just a matter of simplifying, it really is a matter of um, new meanings being gathered in different contexts. And so um, what ends up happening when these kinds of choices are made um, is that um, these choices reflect certain groups' points of view, often at the expense of others. Um, and in this case, the date when the protests end, in, ended up being really important because it enabled some to claim revolution because there was a de debate about whether this was even could be called a revolution and success when others were more reticent to do so um, before they, for example, thought that real change had occurred. And the final example is around the politics of feedback. Now, um, um, politics of feedback, um, this is really around two key questions. One is uh, the ability of um, users and perhaps even more importantly, those who the um, data and facts represent, whether they are able to um, have any agency over the representation of that data if they believe it's incorrect. But probably even more importantly, about the rules that are used to determine whether a change should be made available. So um, in the case of the Google Knowledge um, Panel, um, we don't know how many times it takes for a user to say, uh, to click on feedback and say this is incorrect um, for the um for the information to be changed we don't know what it means uh, we don't know what the rules are so um these are questions that are um, very contentious about um whether people receive meaningful responses to their feedback and whether that that those rule, rules are actually available um so finally um the final thing i'd say is just to reiterate that uh, the development of structured and semantic data and here there's work being done on um, by Andrew Eliadis, for example, on ontologies, um, databases, and specific implementations. So at multiple levels of the semantic or structured data question are contentious, right? These questions are really politically contentious because um, they have meaningful impact on communities around the world. And, and the second thing to say is that certain actors will necessarily prevail over others. And we're starting to see how that's playing out. So one of um, the reasons is because of the way in which the data is framed as technical, that will necessarily involve certain types of people in their representation. Um, also how the data is resourced. You know, If it's resourced primarily by advertising, then when we look at building ontologies about events, for example, we're going to get ticketed events being built, uh, ontologies about ticketed events rather than political events, for example, and also organized. So it, ma it makes a difference that um, these semantic web um, platforms are really arriving up at us as monopolies and um, where billions of people are using them to get the information. And finally, uh, just to reiterate, this has really important consequences or implica implications for those uh, representing statements that end up being reflected as consensus reality. And then for those that are relegated to the category of opinion, random error, or even misinformation. And this is beyond reasons of their truth value. So all of these kinds of social implications that um, play a role in determining what we end up seeing in the knowledge panels. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, uh, and that was really fascinating uh, rounding out of the sort of more um, straightforward information we've looked at so far, looking at what actually um, comes up in those um, uh, the search results and information panels and how this has been set up to be able to flow into, um, uh, so I'll just admit somebody, uh, and um, flow into from Wikipedia via Wikimedia Enterprise. Um, uh, so I'm not sure if anybody has some uh, questions they would like to put, but I would was wondering if um, Liam would be able to uh, talk a little bit about how some of the flows from uh, Wikimedia into something like Google uh, and and whether you know, whether there's an understanding of how uh, that is going to be updated and the, the dynamics of, 
of that because um, actually a lot of these things, as Liam has said in the chat, uh, things on Wikipedia are actually often debated extensively uh, and uh, you know kind of continually sort of updated, but it starts to look um, very concrete once you see it in a knowledge graph and in a in a database, as um, Heather's pointing out. So can I put that over sure, to you? Certainly. Yeah. And to exactly both Heather and Mark's point, uh, once something appears in the right hand side of a Google search result, it seems more fixed, more finite, more official than on the left hand side in the list of results, uh, which is an interesting it's on us. That's psychological. It's still just the web page, the Google result, but it makes it gives you the impression as the reader that this is a fixed fact in 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 time. What makes Wikidata fascinating for me? I'll, I'll get to your your question, Heather, um, but I wanted to emphasise that what makes Wikidata fascinating to me, what makes it unique, I believe, is it's the only uh, structured data source or database out there that is designed with a metadata schema that acknowledges the messiness of knowledge. You can have contradictory statements for the same fact inside a Wikidata item, each with their own references to different sources. And that's okay because it is, it is not a breaking of the data schema. It is designed that way to acknowledge that knowledge is messy. Information is not finite or um, merely objective truth in all circumstances. And I don't think any other kind of cataloging or categorization system builds this flexibility and messiness into the design. Um, I should uh, also say that search engines do not currently use the Wikimedia Enterprise API service. It is new, it'll take them a long time to, in the order of uh, a, a year, I would say, um, to switch over their systems for something so deeply embedded as Wikipedia, let alone Wikidata, uh, from the normal systems they have built up over the years to a new API service. API, Application Programming Interface, is, uh, for, um, for the benefit of the tape, is the method by which uh, one computer talks to another computer uh, and the, the one sending the information structures that information to say, this is the title, this is the first paragraph, uh, these are the categories. It tells you what it is and how to use it. It describes itself rather than what is primarily used by search engines and, and reusers of Wikimedia information to this day, scraping. Scraping is taking the website as it is presented to a human, looking at the code of that, which is available in your anyone's browser, you can click on uh, view, uh, view developer information, view the source code, and it's just all the HTML. And having their robots go through the entire website and just copy and paste it into an internal database where they churn it around, remunge it, strip it apart and try and put it back together in a format that's useful for that company. What makes the, the difference with say the Wikimedia Enterprise API is that scraping services are designed for mass ingestion from uh, various websites. Wikipedia, they probably have a special one. Of course, they don't tell us, it's a secret source uh, inside these companies, highly proprietary information. But all of these different search engines are doing it in their own different way. This makes it highly fragile. The idea that Wikimedia Enterprise is trying to, to get at, as I was saying in my original presentation, is to make something that is consistent, stable, and high velocity, uh, both in their ability to, to extract information and our ability to send new information, such that it is more easy for these organizations to get, obtain reliable results, even if something else on the 
human readable version of Wikipedia, if we change something in the interface, if we move where the search box is from the, the left-hand column to the top right-hand corner, that would break a scraper. And it has done in the past. It shouldn't because that's not designed for the interests of a search engine, how, where things are laid out on the page, what the font is, uh, but that does break scraping. So simply providing a more structured and stable environment for various organizations to take the information for their needs with information about what that information actually represents is a much more uh, stable uh, technologically and informationally environment to work from than simply saying, as we have always done until this day, here's a website, everyone, have at it. Uh, that has been uh, ideologically consistent with the idea of uh, free, uh, free and open source. Anyone can use it for whatever, any purposes they want. They can expect the information. And that's fine. But what we've discovered is that acknowledges or that um, promotes or is to the advantage of the largest players because they have the infrastructure and resources to be able to throw at the problem benefiting monopolistic organizations, the largest companies in the world that have ever existed, and smaller organizations that do not have, uh, or competitors to those large organizations that do not have the technological, human, or financial resources to reverse engineer large data sets, such as Wikidata or Wikipedia, are at a disadvantage and can't compete because they can't take that information and make it useful. By building this new API service that is standardized, it includes the same information as you can get normally, but in a more structured format, it allows a leveling of the playing field where different organizations can compete and can provide access to their customers, to their reusers downstream, to the high quality information that has previously only been available if you could throw large amounts of technological and human capital at the problem. Uh, that is the importance of knowledge as a service, the, the phrase coming from the Wikimedia movement uh, strategic uh, plan, that it is no longer sufficient to merely say, here's knowledge, have at it. We actually have to provide uh, a helping hand. Uh, and if through the language that these reusers understand, which is commercial contracts, uptime standards, rather than just saying uh, in a libertarian format, here's knowledge, it's open, and it's freely licensed. Um, that is no longer sufficient to meet the mission of the Wikimedia movement. Uh, I'll stop there and, um, and pass the microphone back. Yeah, thanks, Liam. Um, I was wondering, um, uh, I don't think we've any, got any other questions, so please, um, so I'll keep asking them unless uh, somebody else wants to jump in. Um, I guess to Heather's point, and perhaps um, Mark might have some views on this, uh, who's, I guess whose responsibility is it or how do we think about the verifiability or the contestability of that, that knowledge? And we're assuming that it's high quality knowledge coming through, but what if it's not? Um, is that on Wikipedia and Wikimedia or is that on Google and other sources that are using that and uh, to be able to kind of alert us to that, that not, not everything is actually uh, totally agreed on, or, or even a clear fact. Um, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I mean, cer certainly, I think the search engines, Google or Bing, or you pick your favorite search engine, they, they will certainly feel the responsibility uh, to the, the results that they're providing. Uh, you know, they're not only using the Wikipedia sources, they're using many other ones. And so I'm certain that they have some sort of checking processes that are going on um, internally to, to make sure that they're reaching some sort of um, um, standard, um, and presumably a fairly high standard 
for those info boxes. You know, just for the reasons that I showed earlier with the how many legs does the chicken have? If you make a mistake, you know, people share that 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 thing around and, and it harms Google. Um, no, no one's blaming Wikipedia for the the how many legs does the chicken have? They're blaming Google. So I'm pretty sure the organization, the search engine, um, cares about those kinds of things. Um, certainly, I find ha having been this person that's gone and uh, claimed his knowledge panel uh, that they're very responsive to any changes that I ask uh, to be made. Um, uh, they both tell me when they're not going to do it and when they have done it. Um, and the response times are usually, I don't know, 24, 48 hours. I've no idea about the feedback thing that, uh, that Heather was talking about. Um, but um, um, and yeah, so I, and, and, and um, just the, the other sort of just 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 a, an anecdote, but the other thing just to say about about different knowledge, I was over in the UK and if I'm seeming a bit jet lagged, it's because I am jet lagged. Um, I, I was in the UK uh, last week and I was talking to my niece. And um, uh, she'd been told by by my sister that I was some um, professor or something. And she said, hey, have you got one of those box things? Um, you know, when you type in your name and I said, oh, I do actually. And then I typed in my name into Google in Britain and it was nowhere to be found. Um, and the reason is that my info box doesn't get shown. You, you, if you push, you, you, can, you can squeeze it out of Google, but it really is quite reluctant to show my name uh, in the UK. Uh, and it's obviously decided uh, for reasons that I, I don't fully understand uh, that, well, I, I'm an Australian based academic, I'm an Australian citizen. Um, and so the box pops up here uh, in the UK, the screenwriter who I was showing earlier, uh, his box comes up as the, as the principal one. Um, and it's actually quite hard to find me. Um, and I think that's really down to Google, Google making some decisions about, you know, in different countries, there are different priorities. Um, it doesn't know my accent. It doesn't know that necessarily that I was born there. Um, but um, but but the, the, there is that sort of there is that concept within the search engines uh, that you know that different countries have different views. Yeah, we actually just finished a study that should be published soon, and um, we asked uh, Google, um, Google Assistant, Apple, uh, um, Apple Siri, and Amazon Alexa in both the um, mobile and smart speaker um, versions, who is uh, 34 um, Order of Australia winners. Um, and actually, they were pretty bad at disambiguating the Australian people from uh, the Australians from their equivalents in mostly in the US. So it was really interesting to see actually. Um, you know, they may be doing it to some at some level, but um, uh, not not that great. Google is by far the um, better one of the three, but still. Um, I mean, actually, my PhD was in disambiguation many, 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 many years ago. It, it, it is a difficult topic. Um, and, you know, there the really are just some perplexing. Uh, my, my old colleague in Sheffield, Peter Willett, uh, who's now retired, um, there's another Peter Willett, and, and both of them do, um, you know, both of them worked in sort of information studies. There's actually, there's another Mark Sanderson who worked at the University of Sheffield, who was also born in December, uh, in the same year as me. Um, and in fact, there was a giant, there was apparently there was a giant red notice on our HR record saying, do not confuse these two people. So uh, disambiguation is not a trivial process. The only thing you can really do is name your kids, uh, you give your kids a unique name uh, and hope that, you, in fact, that's one of the things you'll notice, you know, is, is that quite often those info boxes work better for people who are either super famous or have very unusual names, um, and then and then the chances of sort of um, of, of that ambiguity problem um, uh, becomes uh, le le less prominent. But dealing with ambiguities is much harder than than perhaps one might imagine. Yeah, it's just curious because in this case, Google will definitely bring up these people um, in uh, in the Australian Google will bring them up immediately but not in the structured data of it so um, that's what's uh, intriguing about it i guess i i i actually I, I complained uh, somebody else complained on twitter to one of the google people about these info boxes and then i chimed in because i was a bit grumpy that my info box was getting all confused with those other two people and and, and one of the one of their public people um I forget, his name slips my mind but he said 
look, it's really tricky. He said, he said, we, re, we, you know, it, we, it, it's, it's just hard. Basically, these info boxes about people are being done completely automatically, and those algorithms just aren't perfect. Um, the, the, it's a real limit of the technology. Um, yeah, so Heather, um, I guess I might uh, give you the last word in um, where you see uh, some of the, the, the next um, research questions for this space and the, the key issues that uh, you think we should be looking at to you know, either draw attention to these issues or, or how to, um, yeah, just make sure that people are aware uh, in, in various ways or, or even that Google it takes these issues more seriously and Wikipedia and the Wikimedia community. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, and I'll have to watch the video to hear what others have said. I'm very curious. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think from um, where I see some really interesting um, new work is really around um, structured data in Q&A systems, uh, because at the moment we have uh, more smart speakers than people on the planet. Increasingly, people are using uh, smart speakers and digital assistants to ask and answer questions about the world. Um, and yes, getting the kind of, um, well, imagining how um, these global corporations like Google, who has um, such a monopoly over the technology um, for a question answering um, development, how they are able to and how they respond to this uh, local knowledge question is going to be really interesting and have um, significant uh, political and social effects. So um, I think question answering is is a really interesting area, especially also in terms of machine learning um, and figuring out where that takes us is really, yeah, it's super interesting. Um, and yeah, I think the local question hasn't really been asked to that ex to, to such an extent before. And it's about um, people, you know, far from the headquarters of Google, um, um, you know, to what extent are we creating kind of um, these, these unequal systems where some people can get verified and some people can't um, and, have, and have control basically over knowledge that's represented about them because that's essentially what it, what it is, um, what it's about. Um, and so, yeah, those are just some of the things that I, I, I think are important, but um, I guess, you know, there's a lot of work happening at the ADMS center that is, is related um, in terms of search and um, I just think structured data is something that doesn't often get examined a lot. Um, and it's it's really powerful. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a really important area. Fantastic. And um we've just got one minute to go. So I was just wondering if you would um, briefly uh, mention your ARC discovery um, grant and what you'll be doing with that, Heather. Thanks, Amanda. How about putting me on the spot? Um, Sorry. Yes. No, no, no. It's um, it's actually about looking at the how history is written um, about Australian history is written on Wikipedia, um, and there will be quite a big data component um, to that actually. So um, we're looking at the concept of bias and how think people think about bias. Um, in theory, and then also looking at a bunch of different types of articles uh, related to Australian history. Um, and we're, we're doing a, a kind of multifaceted study that's gonna, with the historian Tamsin Peach, um, who I'm working with on it, and hopefully with input from the Wikimedia Foundation, um, and with Nathaniel Katz, who is Australian, but um, is at Warwick, and has written a beautiful book about Wikipedia. So. Um, it's a really exciting project over three years. Um, we haven't started it yet, but it should start um, mid-year. And um, yeah, some really interesting findings, I think, um, that are really um, in interesting for Australia and how um, the challenges that people face and also the, the, the successes that they are seeing in, in reporting a kind of people's history. Fantastic. So exciting to um, to get a research project like that funded. And um, yeah, really wonderful. Uh, so I would just like to thank 
um, uh, Liam for getting up early in the morning, for Mark for coming, <laughs> staying awake with uh, jet lag, and to Heather for uh, for being very patient while she could not get on to this event. Um, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, so, and thank you everybody for coming along. Thanks very much to Wikimedia Australia for supporting the promotion of this event and to um, the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision-Making Society for, um, for their you know, supporting uh, ongoing interest in Wikimedia and uh, its role in the knowledge ecosystem. Uh, uh, with that, we can probably turn off the, uh, not sure if we just turn off the recording, but uh, thank you everybody so much.